So far, we've heard expectations that the equity markets will continue to slide following the S&P's downgrade of U.S. debt. So how do we protect our portfolio? Our next guest says you should have been prepared for this first. Uh, we turn to Jason Pereira, financial advisor and partner at Bennett March and IPC. Good to have you with us. Thanks, Michael. Sure. Me. We, we, we've been asking, you know, so you know, when do these markets bottom? And th these are the kinds of questions that guys like you I know hate to get. You know, how, how far does a knife fall before it hits the floor? We don't know where this is going to happen. Although it's getting to the point, if you look at some of the valuation numbers, it's getting to the point of where it's beyond reason at this point. I uh, had an email just before I came in here that said that the forward earning multiple on the S&P is about 8.6 now as of today's close. 8.6. That's only about two-thirds of the historical norm, if not mm -hmm. less. So, and the difference between that and the yield on U.S. Treasuries is so narrow now that you have to question whether or not it's getting further to fall. But the, the underlying idea here is that you can't time this market. Absolutely. It's not about timing the market. No, not at all. And you can try and succeed from time to time and fail just as often. But really, it's time in the market that matters more than timing the market. And what I mean by that is that there's been numerous studies done that show that mutual funds or just long-term investing, holding an index, whatever it is, if you stay in the market and ride the ups and downs, you will receive that average return we always hear about. But the average Canadian consumer experiences only about half that return. And that's because of their own basic panic. They get out at the wrong time or get in at the wrong time. So from a, a personal advisor perspective, I, I'm going to ask you a question now that's going to make you enemies all along the bars on Wellington tonight. Um, if you haven't heard from your financial advisor yet, is that a bad sign? I wouldn't say just yet. Point is, is that well, I'll give you an example of what we're going to be doing. Next couple of days, myself and my partners, we're going to be on the phones to just about all our clients. And we have a number of clients, of course, and getting all to all of them in one day is basically impossible. Mm -hmm. You should be hearing from your advisor in times of panic. I often hear that advisors say that, well, oh, I feel like hiding under my desk. Well, you know, that's not what we're here for. We're here to help guide people through the hard times. So let's guide people through, I suppose, the three key demographics that we often talk about. We start with young people, uh, but as you point out, uh, there are two types of young people who are investing today, those who already have the house and those who are planning to buy the house. Absolutely. We typically tend to lump them all into one category that says, you've got between 30, 40, maybe 50 years until retirement, depending on how young you are. So invest for the long term, put it all in equities and ride it out because you have this timeline. But that's not reality. Reality is, is that these people are going to have houses to buy, engagement rings, cars, kids on the way. These are all major life events that require major cash dispensations. And really, your timeline for that is a lot smaller than retirement. So if you're looking to do that in the next couple of years, you should already have the bulk of your savings in cash or maybe short-term bonds, risk, bonds as risky as that is. And that's really as far as you should go. As for the, the other people who are looking to, or the other sec segment of that group who can afford to invest for the long term now, mm -hmm. then yes, they can afford to take on more risk. But what, what about those who have the house? They've got the ring on their finger. They're, at the sort of, they're, they're approaching their peak earnings mm -hmm. uh, potential. And this is sort of that, that middle-aged group of, of Canadians. Yes. What's the advice on that front? Well, they, they actually tend to be, especially the latter part of that group, tends to be the more difficult to console in this time. Because mm -hmm. at that point, their portfolios have moved into the hundreds of thousands, maybe even to the millions. And there's a big difference between a 10% drop when you have $50,000 invested than when you you have half a million dollars invested. Seeing your portfolio drop by $50,000 can be unnerving to anyone. Yeah, yeah, you're the one who wants to be under the, the desk at that point as an investor. <laughs> exactly. So basically, uh, with that point, they still need to really stick to that timeline. To re we got to reinforce the fact that, look, your goal of retirement is still years away. These are the buy and hold investors. Exactly. All right. Now, uh, for those who are pushing closer towards that Freedom 55, Freedom 65, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. you are on the verge of retirement. Uh, what kind of you know, scenario are they dealing with in, in this equity environment? Or should they even be in stocks at this well, point? Well, they, they should. But the question is how much. And not only that, we've got to look beyond just traditional stocks and bonds or, maybe, or mutual fund portfolios. There is a field of study that's been kind of studied, started in the last couple of years, a professor that I had the privilege of learning under, Moshe Maleski at York mm. University. We spoke to him recently. There you go. And he developed something called product allocation. It says that we have traditional investments on one hand, but we also have on the other, other end of the spectrum annuities. This, you give your money to an insurance company, they give you an income stream for life exchange. So you don't have assets, but you have income. Then you have this middle ground, these guaranteed minimum withdrawal benefit funds, which, get, which are mutual fund slash insurance portfolios where you see the assets, but you also have a, an income stream coming to, to you for life. His entire process says we can basically take those three, look at what the income need is for life and how much you have to invest, and basically determine how much you should invest in each in order to secure your income for life. What's the risk associated with a GMWB? 
Well, the risk associated with it is, well, first of all, it reduces the, the investor's risk because regardless of market conditions, it guarantees you a minimum floor on the income from the portfolio. But lower risk, lower reward. Well, it's going to cost you about an extra point uh, compared to a regular MER in order to have that benefit. So yes, there is lower risk, lower reward, but there's still, again, this, you're, you're saving for retirement, you're building up this nest egg, but really, what's it really there for? It's not to have a giant pile of money. It's to sustain your income or sustain your lifestyle in retirement, and that is income. So income is what we have to protect at that stage. What's, what's the average recommendation in, uh, as far as equity exposure? You know, we, we used to take that 100, subtract your age, that, that is yeah. what you've got left for stocks. I'm not really a believer in that. That's because regardless of how old you are, every investor is different. And this is all about keeping them from pulling the plug when markets are down, because then they'll never experience that upturn again. Mm -hmm. So really what it comes down to, it comes down to actually meeting a client, profiling them as an investor, learning about where they're going to panic, and getting to see, and not only that, matching their portfolio to their timeline so that when these downturns happen, yeah, they feel upset that they've lost money, but they don't completely get out of the market. So there's no one rule of thumb, but technically most clients fall between, I'd say, about 60% bonds to 30% bonds. All right, full circle. If I don't hear from my advisor by the end of the week, gashfinkto, fire him, right? I wouldn't say that. You have to look at your overall, your overall relationship with them, but definitely you should be getting something either by email, a phone call, whatever it is, something to try to show that they're trying to reassure you at the very least. All right, you hear that, Bruno? I was Jason Pereira, financial advisor and partner at Bennett March and IPC Investment. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. We'll, of course, stay on top of all of the market action. You're watching The Close on Business News Network. I'm Michael Hainsworth.